Uh, Chuck already read the story for us, so uh, I'll let that suffice for this morning. But we come today to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This completes the hour that we've been looking at the last three weeks. If you recall, we began with an hour of praise. Jesus, as he marched into Jerusalem, had the crowds cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was a, a tremendous praise celebration that took place that day. It also became an hour of purpose. In John chapter 13, Jesus gave us the purpose for this hour that he spoke of. It was to demonstrate the depth of God's love for us. Remember, he said, having loved his own, he loved them to the uttermost there. Last week, we saw it as an hour of pain. We looked at the seven sayings of Christ on the cross and how they apply to our life today. We want to finish that by looking today at an hour of power. The resurrection proclaims the power of God to us today. J.P. Morgan, the moldy millionaire, I think captured that truth as he left his final will to, to be read. It, his will consisted of over 10,000 words. It had 37 articles in it, made transactions involving large sums of money. But the most significant thing about his, what, his will was the fact that he left no doubt as to what he considered his most important transaction in life. He said these words, I commit my soul into the hands of my Savior in full confidence, having redeemed and washed it in his most precious blood. He will present it faultless before my heavenly Father, and I entreat my children to maintain and defend at all hazards at any cost of personal sacrifice the blessed doctrine of the complete atonement for sin through the blood of Jesus Christ once offered and through that alone. What a remarkable insight he had as he came to his final moments in, in this life. Christ on the cross proclaimed, it is finished. His death made it possible for us to have our sins forgiven. The price was paid for that. Why then the resurrection? Why the demonstration of, of his power through the resurrection? Why didn't he go directly from the cross to heaven? Why spend parts of three days in the grave and then come back to interact with his disciples? There are four reasons, at least, given in Scripture for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what we want to look at this morning. First of all, Jesus' resurrection proclaimed his deity. Paul mentions that in Romans chapter 1, in verse 4, where it says, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. His resurrection demonstrated for us that he was God. He was the, the Son of God there. No mere human has the privilege or the opportunity to be resurrected by himself. I still remember years ago, uh, I was pastor at, in Little at British Columbia. I, I knew the uh, funeral director in that community quite well. There was only one funeral parlor there, so you, you soon got to know him. But he would often call me when he had somebody that uh, didn't have a church contact or anything and ask if I would do a service. I, I think he liked the fact that I tend to keep funeral services short. Uh, he, he was not a believer in Christ. But he called one day and said, I have a favor to ask. He said, I had a, a body that was brought in from Alberta. Uh, they had, had a funeral service for the individual in Alberta, but his wishes were to be buried in Gold, Goldbridge, British Columbia. Now, Goldbridge was about 70 miles west of, of Lillooet. Had been for years a gold mining town. The, the mines had played out. There were just a few houses left and a bar. And that was the extent of Goldbridge, except for the fact that there was a cemetery there. And this individual evidently had worked in Goldbridge and, and made part of his fortune there. And so he left instructions to be buried in the cemetery in Goldbridge. 
as we were making our way out, I, I was riding with him in the hearse. I, I knew that something was troubling him. And he finally, he said, you know, I am having a rough time with this committal service. And I said, well, what, what's the problem? I, I thought, I'm doing the service. Why, why are you upset about it? He said, well, I, I, he said, I can't go along with the, with the family on this one. Uh, he, he, said, um, he said, you haven't seen the casket yet, but you'll see it when, when we get there. He said, it is the most beautiful, most expensive casket that I have ever worked with. The whole top was inlaid with tiles and so forth. And, and he said, you'll notice in the, one of the corners, there's a, something screwed into the corner. He said, that's a microfilm. In it is the history of the man of, of, and also recorded what he died for. He said, the, the body is actually embalmed in liquid nitrogen. And the idea is that someday science is going to discover a cure for the disease that he died of. And they're going to bring him back to life and cure the disease. He said, I can't go along with that. I said, well, we don't have to go along with it because that, that's the family's problem. But I said, I doubt that that's going to happen. And it's been over 45 years since we had that committal service. It was very, almost very comical. It was just two or three people from the community was all that was there. And, and one or two family members had made the trip over. And uh, here is a rock pile, basically, is what it was. And a, a, a grave dug in the rock pile, this, this beautiful casket put down in amongst the rocks and covered with rocks and dirt. And it still sits there because man doesn't have the right to resurrection. We, we have the right to be resurrected, but we can't command our, our resurrection. I'm sure this man meant well. I don't doubt that he believed it was possible, but it was beyond his ability and beyond the ability of science as well. The resurrection is God's prerogative. He is the only one who has the power to raise the death. He has the key to life and death, not man. What does the resurrection of Jesus Christ say to us today? I think, first of all, of John 14, verse 19, where he says, because I live, you shall live also. It says that we have the hope of a resurrection. We have hope of, of life beyond the grave. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse uh, 19, we have the... Uh, question raised by Paul. He said, if, if we have hope in Christ, in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But praise the Lord, he didn't stop with that verse. The next verse says, now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who sleep. The first fruits indicate there's more to come. He was resurrected. We will be resurrected someday as, as well. We have that hope to look forward to. Death, whether we like it or not, is a reality for us today. The ratio is still one out of one. It hasn't changed much over the years. But uh, as uh, our praise team read in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, death, where is your victory? It's gone. Christ has won the, the, the victory for us. And because he lives, we can have today assurance of eternal life. In John chapter 3, verse 16, Jesus, or God said, uh, God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only begotten son for us, that whosoever believeth in him might have eternal life. A few verses later in that same chapter, in verse 36, he says, he who believes in the son has eternal life. That is made possible today for us because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can celebrate that, that eternal life today. And then Jesus' resurrection provides for our forgiveness today. In, in Acts chapter 17, we have the account of the Apostle Paul preaching in, Car or in Athens, actually. And uh, he went to Mars Hill there. He was invited to present 
his message. And in verse 30 of that chapter, 30 and 31, he says, therefore, having looked at, he's talking about God here, looked at the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by rising, raising him from the dead. And in that moment, as he, he was raised from the dead, we were provided with forgiveness. And why do we say that? The day is coming when God is going to judge the world. Not only the world, but you and I. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 3.14, our lives are going to be tried by fire. 2 Corinthians 5.10, the same idea there, dealing with believers and, and unbelievers. But we don't need to fear the judgment of God. Why? Because Jesus Christ on the cross took that judgment for us. And, and he has given us the opportunity to have forgiveness of our sins. Uh, and the resurrection is a reminder to us that we have been forgiven. That for us, the sin question has been settled. Year, years ago, we were living outside of Three Hills, Alberta. Three Hills was the home of, of Prairie Bible Institute. We, we were not part of the Bible Institute. I wasn't going to that, but we knew several of the students and the staff from, from the church in which he was attend, attending there. And one of the men that we got to meet had been living in a remote Indian village up on the coast of British Columbia. And he had a desire to share the gospel and, and, and to uh, reach those in the area w with the gospel message, but he felt totally unprepared for that. And so he was going for a couple of years to Prairie Bible Institute so he could better go back and, and minister to, to the Indian people in that area. One day he received a message from somebody in the village saying that a medicine man from Oregon was coming and he was going to introduce the people in the village to the peyote cult and, and teach them how they, they, their lives could be changed and revolutionized by taking this little drug and so forth there. And uh, Al felt, I've got to be there. I've got to stand against this. And so he asked permission from the school if he could have a couple of days off and, and told them why, and they graciously gave him permission to go. He went and he sat in on the meeting in which this man was presenting his new religion to, to the group. And at the end of it, he invited questions. And Al could not keep quiet. <laughs> Al got up and he said, I have just one question for you. He said, what are you going to do about the sin question? And this man, this medicine man looked at him and he said, I don't have any solution for the sin question. He said, I, I, I can give you a, a high in this life and so forth, but I, I don't have any solution for the sin question. And I was able to say, but we do. It's in Jesus Christ. The, the question has been settled for us there. How do we know that? Well, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then in Psalm 103, verse 12, he speaks of the fact as far as the east is from the west, that's how far I've removed your transgressions from you. And I like the way Isaiah puts it in Isaiah 43, verse 25. The Lord is speaking there. Uh, he says, I even I am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake. Catch that? He, he's wiped out our transgressions there. He said, and I will not remember your sins anymore. They are gone. We have been forgiven because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I think the end result of that comes out in Romans chapter 8, where Paul says, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus today? Then your sins are gone. You've been forgiven. There, there is no farther any condemnation for you today. We couldn't say that 
before we accepted Jesus Christ as a personal savior, could we? We were under God's condemnation. We were under the sentence of death. But Christ made it possible for us to have God's forgiveness today. And then Jesus' resurrection procures for us our justification. In Romans chapter 4, verse 25, he says, He was delivered up because of our transgressions. He's dealing with the cross there. Went to the cross to pay for our transgressions. But then he goes on to say he was raised because of our justification. Uh, why he, did he have to be raised? So that we could be fully justified before God. Uh, the end result of that is chapter 5 there, verse 1. Therefore, being, having been justified by faith, we have what? We have peace. Do you have peace today? Are you experiencing peace in your heart? You can today because he was raised for your justification. He rose to secure the result of his, his death for us. Hebrews chapter 9 deals with that in uh, verses 11 through 15. I'm not going to take time to read them today, but he, he speaks of the fact there that, you know, the blood of bulls and goats couldn't do that in the Old Testament. Yes, it, it covered their sin for a time, but it was, it was just a picture of what was going to happen when Christ came and died and became the ultimate sacrifice for our sin. And he goes on in that chapter to reveal the fact that a covenant, a will, is only in effect when the person that made the will dies. Christ made that covenant with us. He died and he lives again to make sure that his covenant is carried out. Now, as long as a person is alive, they have the right to change their will. Now, I had that happen to me when I was in high school. My great grandfather passed away. There were two people named in his will. One was my uh, great aunt, that was his daughter. And he left the house to her. And, and he left whatever money was left in the bank to me. The only problem was, two days before he died, she was in charge of his estate, and, and he wasn't able to write checks. And so she emptied his bank account and put it in her bank. And there was no money left. Uh, she said, I might need that money before I die. And, and so uh, I'm sure that was my great-grandfather's desire, she said, that must have been what he meant, so I, I took the money. But she said, I will leave whatever I have left in my will to you when I die. And she said, you'll probably come out better on that because she had more money and a better job than my great-grandfather ever had. And what do you do as a teenager? You, you can argue, but uh, you, you're not going to get very far. And it's a family matter, so we just dropped it. And for years, the promise was made, someday you're going to be named in my will. The night before she died, she asked her attorney to come to the hospital, and she rewrote her will. And guess who got nothing out of the situation? <laughs> it, it was her money. She could do what she wanted with it. And uh, until she died, she had that opportunity. But Christ made a covenant he died, and that covenant stands today. And he is the one, because he came back to life, he is the one that is seeing it fulfilled for us. When he arose, he presented his sacrifice at the heavenly altar. And, and that covenant was ratified. And, and in Hebrews chapter 10, he speaks of the fact in, in verse 15 there. Uh, the... I'm not sure if 15 is the one I wanted there. Well, it, yeah, I said 12 through 15. Uh, okay, I'll start. I'll just read the passage, and then it'll hit me. He, he, having offered one sacrifice for sin at all times, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for the time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. Incidentally, what's his final enemy? Praise team. You read it for us. Death. Yes, he's going to do away with that for us. 
For by one offering he perfected for all time those who are sanctified. That's the verse I was actually looking for. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart, and, and upon their mind I will write them. And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. He is alive today. His will is being carried out in our lives. That's why, because he was raised for our justification, we can have peace with God. That's not something we look forward to in the future. It's something that can be a reality for us today. He has made peace between us and God. He has paid the price. His covenant, his will, is in effect today. And I like the way the writer of Hebrews puts it in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. It speaks of the fact that Christ as our high priest ever liveth to do what? To make intercession for us. He is praying for us today. Do you ever have situations crowd into your life that you just don't know what to ask for or, or how, to, how to pray? You can take comfort in the fact that he is before the Father's throne praying for you in the midst of those situations. No wonder he says in, in Romans 5, we can have peace today. He is interceding for us today. And then the, the fourth thing here is the resurrection predicts our resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, we, we looked at verse 20 there, where he speaks of the fact that he is the first fruit. We are the re remaining part of it. The first fruit it was that, uh, I, I think, years ago, we had our first big garden. And I don't know how many tomato plants we had in there, but we watched them every day as the tomatoes set on. And, and, and we had one nice big one that was turning red, and we were just about ready to pick it. And then I went out the next day, and it was gone. I found out later that our neighbor was watching it as well. <laughs> and, and he picked it before us, and, and they, he, he apologized. But he said, we really enjoyed it. <laughs> but you know, that tomato was just the first one, just the first fruits. We had an abundant harvest on the vines that, that year. And in a sense, Christ is the first fruits. He was the first one resurrected. But remember, he said in John chapter 14, because I live, you will live also. We look forward to the resurrection because Christ was raised from the dead. We can be assured of heaven. We can be assured of eternal life. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, if I go away, I'm going to come and receive you unto myself. And that's made possible in John 14 and verse 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so the resurrection became for us an important part of the hour that for which Christ came into the world. There is ample evidence that testifies today of his resurrection. Uh, I think that truth was captured by a eight-year-old boy. He, he was born with Down syndromes. He was a pleasant child. He was happy. But he was increasingly aware of the fact that he was different from the other kids, and that presented some problems for him. His name was Philip. He went to Sunday school at a small Methodist church. His teacher of the third grade class taught Philip and nine other boys and girls in his class. Uh, uh, his teacher somehow realized that Philip just didn't fit into the group. The others made fun of him at times. They, they ignored him, but he, he just wasn't a part of the group. And try as he would, the, the teacher couldn't seem to get around that. One day, he had the idea of trying to convey to the class the resurrection and, and what it meant and so forth. It, it was the Sunday after Easter, and 
the teacher brought in, uh, how many of you remember when pantyhose came in those, those egg-shaped things? <laughs> I, I don't know if they still do or not. Oh, yeah. Do they? Okay, they're, they're, they're still around. The, the teacher came up with the bright idea of bringing one of those eggs in for each of the students. And he gave them out, the kids were delighted with them uh, because he sent them outside and let them roam through the, the property of the church with the condition that they find something that represented the resurrection and they were to put it into the, the eggshell and bring it back into the classroom. And so they were excited about it. They had a great time out there. Uh, you, you know how eight-year-olds are. They get out of class. That, that's something to celebrate. <laughs> and, and so they, they were having a great time at it and they brought them in and the teacher then, one by one, began to open the eggs. One of them, the first ones that he opened, had a, uh, a flower in it, and, uh, talking about new life there. The, the next one had a, a, a butterfly. And the student tried to explain how that mentioned new life there. The, the third one he opened had a rock in it. And everybody kind of laughed at that one. and. Uh, the, the, the boy that brought that rock, uh, uh, the kid said, that's crazy. That doesn't represent new life. But the, the little boy was a little smarter than that. He said, I knew all of you would pick flowers and buds and butterflies. And so I put a rock in mine, he, he said, because it's different. And he said to me, that represents new life because, because of Christ, I'm different. And so I thought, good insight there. And then... He opened the next one, and there was nothing in it. It was empty. The kids said, hey, that's not fair. That's not, that's stupid. That shouldn't be that way. Somebody didn't do it right. And on and on went the comments until the teacher felt somebody tugging at, at his coat there. And Philip was there, and Philip said, it's mine. It's my egg. And the kids started laughing at him, saying, you didn't do it right, Philip. You never do anything right. He said, I did so. I did it. It's empty. The tomb is empty. Yeah. There was silence in the room. And for you people that don't believe in miracles, he said, a miracle happened that day. Suddenly, Philip was part of the group. They welcomed him into the group, and everything was different for him from then on. Later that summer, Philip died. He had Down syndrome, but he also had several other health issues. And his parents knew from when he was born that he wouldn't last uh, very long. Uh, uh, he got an infection that most children could quickly shake off. But Philip was not able to do that. At the funeral, nine eight-year-old children marched up to the altar with their teacher, not with flowers to cover the stark reality of death, but they each placed a pantyhose egg in the coffin to represent the new life that Philip was experiencing. They learned a tremendous lesson that day. They learned the truth of a song that we sometimes sing, I serve a risen savior. He's in the world today. Some of you know it. All right, I, I'm not the only one here. Uh, I know that he is living whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always there. Song is entitled, He Lives. He lives today. And we are celebrating that fact t today. It's remarkable how the resurrection changed the lives of his followers, the women that came to the tomb, the disciples that witnessed the empty tomb, the followers that were caught up in that. And it can change our life as well. We can live in light of the resurrection today. Uh, the, uh, we, we can experience forgiveness of sin. Through the, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for us. We can experience peace in our heart today, no matter what the circumstances are. 
we have someone that's praying for us. Someone that's walking through those trials with us today. We, we can experience that peace. And we can anticipate a glorious future because he lives. We are going to live as well. Back in the 1920s, as the Bolshevik Revolution was going on, Joseph Stalin was attempting to extend his chokehold over the Soviet Empire. He sent political speakers out to the towns and villages. Their purpose was to brainwash the people into adopting Marxism and the Russian form of communism. The villagers were forced to listen to hours and hours of lectures as these men attempted to convince them and, and change their mind about life there. One official went to a, a village and he failed to take into account the teaching of the Russian Orthodox Church about the resurrection there. A, a large crowd sat in an auditorium for three hours listening to this man talk about Marxism and try to convert them to the glories of the Communist Party. When he finished, exhausted, he was satisfied that he had convinced the crowd that they should give up their religion and become part of the Communist Party. He invited questions, and here and there people rose to ask a question. As things were about to end, an Orthodox priest sitting in the back of the hall stood up and he said, I have just one thing to say to you. Christ is risen. Yeah, let, let me say that again. You didn't sound like you, you believed it or meant it. <laughs> Christ is risen. Risen indeed. Do you believe it? Then you have a reason to say hallelujah. Praise the Lord for, for who and what he has done for us today. Let's pray. Father, today we want to stop and just say thank you that the tomb is empty. Christ has risen. We have the hope of eternal life. And we have the help that we need today because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. That hour was finished, and we have the joy of knowing that someday, because he rose from the dead, someday we will have the privilege of being with you in glory. And we thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.